So you're thinking about picking up a brand new Raspberry Pi, but you're not quite sure where to get started with it. Today, I'll give you my top five tips on how to get started and how to make the most out of your Raspberry Pi. Let's jump into tip number one. So tip number one is going to be to size your storage. It might seem obvious, but it's actually something I see all the time and not just with Raspberry Pis, but make sure that you get enough capacity from the get go. I see this time and time again, where people try to save a couple dollars or pounds and they actually buy not enough storage at the start. It might seem like it's enough and then you quickly run out of space down the road and then you end up buying twice. So you actually end up spending more than you would have originally. Secondly, you'll want to choose a good quality SD card with a class rating. The class ratings are the official standards that determine the minimum sustained write speed for the SD card. If you choose to get a lower class speed rating, you might find that the performance on your Pi really sucks and that's just because it can't write to the SD card fast enough. My recommendation here would be to get a 32 gigabyte class 10 A1 performance SD card, which should give you all the performance and capacity that you need for not very much cost. And I will link one in the description down below. My second tip is to consider how are you going to interact with your Pi? What do I mean by that? There are two main ways in which you could interact with your Pi. The first one's obvious in where you plug in a display, a keyboard, a mouse, and use it like a traditional desktop. The second way is where you use your Pi as a headless Pi. <laughs> headless Pi. This is where there is no physical keyboard, mouse, or display connected to the Pi, and you access it from a second laptop or desktop using software like VNC or SSH. This allows you to get a virtual display direct to your Pi as if you were sat in front of it from wherever you are. This is super useful for being able to access your Pi from anywhere in your house, just set it and forget it with a single power supply being all you need to access it. The reason you might want to do this is if you have a program or service that automatically starts on your Pi but doesn't necessarily need a display connected to it. But it's handy to be able to remote on and troubleshoot if there are any problems when you need to. Now if that sounds complicated, don't worry, it's really not. Raspberry Pi OS has all the options built in and it takes just a couple of seconds to enable. You actually don't need to choose between traditional or headless mode. You can run both at the same time, meaning you get the benefits of both. My third tip is actually to choose a good quality power supply. And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with anything? The reason being is that if your power supply isn't up to the task, you might actually be leaving performance on the table and not reaching the maximum potential of your Pi. You see, if your power supply doesn't provide enough current or voltage, it could mean that your Pi CPU doesn't get the power it needs, which in turn could mean that it can't hit its max clock speeds. In some cases, you could actually run into stability or even crashing issues. So make sure you get a good power supply. Again, I'll leave one in the link down below. Tip number four to get the most out of your Pi is to consider whether it needs any additional cooling. The Raspberry Pi has managed to retain its tiny footprint ever since the first version up until the latest iteration, the Pi 4. But the performance has increased tenfold since then, so as I'm sure you can appreciate, cooling the Pi can become a bit of an issue. Allowing the Pi to get too hot when it's working can result in throttling or limiting of the CPU clocks in order to reduce temperature, so adding additional cooling can help keep performance at its max. However, you should definitely consider your use case. If you plan on running intensive tasks on your Pi for hours and hours on end, I would definitely add active cooling in the form of a fan. If you plan on using it here and there, but nothing too intensive, and it's gonna remain idle a lot of the time, you should be okay, but you could add passive cooling in the form of a heatsink. There's no downside to adding a passive heatsink, and they're so cheap, so I'd probably recommend doing that anyways. But all in all, just make sure to keep an eye on the temperatures. My fifth and final tip is to choose a project that's suited to your skill level. If you haven't ever used a Pi or even Linux before, then tackling a project like a CNC machine, a 3D scanner, or even a pinball machine is gonna seem like a pretty daunting task. And one that's likely to end up with your Pi being flung in that one junk cupboard that we all have. But just make sure to choose a realistic project that is achievable. Even turning an LED on with the Pi's GPIO is a great place to start and you will learn so much from doing so. Then you can work your way up to the bigger projects once you get more comfortable. So that is my top five tips on getting started with and making the most out of your brand new Raspberry Pi. But I'm interested, what other tips do you have that I didn't include here? Make sure to drop them in a comment down below. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, could you please make sure to hit the like button and make sure to get subscribed. Also down below, let me know what other videos you want to see and I'll do my best to make them. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.